you added rather significantly to your stake in Palantir? Yes, uh, they reported yesterday, and uh, the stock was uh, down on the report. Um, it, it's interesting to listen to the CEO. Um, he was speaking our language. He, he essentially said to investors, you know, we are playing in a massive space here, and we're going to invest aggressively now in order to capitalize on the exponential changes that are taking place here. Uh, so if you are short term in your focus, um, you probably don't want to spend too much time investing in Palantir. Uh, so that's music to our ears because, and, and we do believe more and more companies are going to start behaving in this way instead of catering to short term uh, time horizons uh, and short term, short, we would say in some cases short sighted shareholders who are much more interested in profits now dividends now, share repurchases now, then they are in a company investing aggressively for going short-term profitability in order to really to catch some very big waves out there. Uh, so uh, I'm astonished. Their, their, work, they, their, their uh, revenues are still 61% government, but I've learned, and I think most people in the innovation space have learned over time, that some of the most important I innovations uh, in our lifetimes have started in the government, especially in the, in the defense sector and in the intelligence sector. So we think in many ways, and they won't talk about how, uh, but they're certainly garnering a lot of business, which tells us that they are uh, seeing in the future and investing in the future in, in ways that companies, governments, uh, but but in, increasingly, companies are going to uh, need, uh, especially as we're competing against China. I think we've been, uh, again, with this short-term time horizon, we have not been spending enough in innovation. And so, you know, Palantir's attitude is refreshing. It's exactly how uh, we invest. We want our companies to invest aggressively. We don't want profits now. We want them to invest aggressively because we're moving into many winner take most markets. And the autonomous taxi world is a very good example of that. That is why our confidence in Tesla, going back to the largest position in our portfolio is so high. I'm gonna ask you about more stocks in just a moment. You spoke of a lot of the stocks in the, in the, the flagship fund as having a longer runway than maybe you know, some would suggest the, the pandemic would, 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 would say. It seems undeniable to me, though, that you must be thinking about the impact of higher rates on the kinds of stocks that have been tried and true winners for you all throughout, whether it's the Signature Fund, the FinTech Innovation Fund, and even other areas of, of the ETFs that you have. Are, are you worried that as rates go up, those stocks could come down? Uh, well, I, I do believe if rates were to take a sharp turn up, uh, that we would uh, we would see a valuation reset and our portfolios would uh, would be um, prime candidates for that valuation reset, of course. Now, one of the things that I found interesting over the last uh, over the last really 20 years is that the the S&P's P.E. ratio tends to peak out in the 20 to 25 times range of the forward forward earnings. And I think the reason for that is most portfolio managers and maybe quantitative research uh, researchers are looking at normalized nominal GDP growth in the four to five percent range, which is where long term interest rates should be normalized. Uh, we actually think normalized uh, GDP growth is probably closer to three. Now, if you think, uh, and, and that's where long-term interest rates uh, should stabilize. If you think of 20 to 25 times, uh, that's one over four to five percent growth. So it's the inverse of the growth rate, the nominal GDP growth. And that's where it seemed to be peaking out. We think there's actually longer term. Uh, I agree with you, Scott. There will be a valuation reset. There will be fear, I'm sure, and we will use it to our benefit, concentrating our portfolio to our highest conviction names. Uh, but I think longer term, especially given the 
the powerful growth trajectories that the five innovation platforms around which we revolve all of our research, uh, that, that those trajectories are so powerful uh, that these multiples, that they, these companies are going to grow into their multiples a lot faster than most uh, investors are now expecting. And so that's a source of confidence for us. Steve Weiss has a question for you, Kathy. Hi, Steve. Hey, Kathy, good to see you again. Uh, so so my, my question plays off what Scott just asked you. Do you take into account or do you have any type of forecast in terms of rates and adjust the portfolio to that forecast? Or do you keep cash there? And ETFs are kind of interesting in terms of the level of cash you're allowed to keep or not keep. Um, so, so how do you do it? So rates right now, they're moving up. Do you say, OK, we may be in a little trouble here with this valuation reset. They're going to jump up another whatever up to, you know, maybe 2%. Do you get in front of it or do you just take it as it comes? No, we, we use it, actually. Uh, and so what we've been doing for the last six months is expanding the number of names in our portfolio. And we do that um, as a bull market extends because it, it's, in some ways it's a tax efficient strategy. What we will do during a correction, especially a severe correction, like the coronavirus crisis presented, we will sell names in which, which are creating losses now, because again, we've bought them, we've diversified and bought them more recently, sell those names creating losses to buy our highest conviction names. Uh, some of the names we've been moving into, you'll notice, uh, our names like uh, some of the bigger biotech names, uh, Regeneron, Novartis, uh, uh, Takeda. And what we will do during, and, and we, we think of them as cash-like, but there's also a reason, an investment reason we are moving into them. Uh, ironically, we think they're deep value names because these companies, the ones we are choosing, are uh, they are able to use the convergence of technologies that is taking place today in the genomic revolution. So DNA sequencing, artificial intelligence, once again, uh, and uh, gene therapies, uh, new technologies, new ways of doing things. Uh, they are investing aggressively now. They have to because they've lost a lot of their pipelines or will soon do so. Uh, and we think the returns on investment in the biotech space, and I'm talking big biotechs, if they're doing this correctly, could move from the high single digits today back into the golden age of healthcare. So in the 80s, we saw 20 to 30 percent. So we're using them as cash-like instruments in, in some, some way because we will move back into our pure play names uh, if we get into a severe correction. But we also see the investment merit in these names. They're just not pure play names. So we, we use corrections toggling back and forth. And so right now, our flagship, uh, our flagship portfolio has roughly 52 names in it. At the low point in the coronavirus last year, it was as low as 33, I believe. Kathy, Bob's going to wrap it up uh, with you. I have one quick question. for What do you view of the SPACs right now? W would you ever invest in, in these SPACs? We are investing in them. Which ones? Uh, not all of them. We think there's, well, DraftKings, Skills, Butterfly, that uh, that uh, merger was just consummated today. Blade, which I think is still going under the name Experience, so that uh, that uh, acquisition has not been consummated yet. So yes, we're but we're being very careful. Uh, we don't like the opacity okay. in some of these uh, in some of these specs, and uh, nor the uh, incentive system in some, some of them. Uh, but yeah. this is a way for venture capital uh, to, uh, to uh, have a liquidity events uh, sooner than might otherwise yeah. have been the case, giving the public markets yeah. an, uh, an opportunity mm. to invest in some innovation-oriented names much sooner than, than uh, might have been the ca case with just the IPO process. Uh, we understand the, Kathy, the questionable nature of the, the compensation schemes in some of them. Though. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Kathy, we've only got a couple minutes left, so I'll need a quick answer. We want to ask you about something that's exciting a lot of us here at CNBC, and that's the Mars landing tomorrow. It's going to be one of the great technology feats of all time. I know you filed for a, a space ETF. Can you tell us what excites us about space? You said earlier in December 
It's important to get on the right side of change and stay on the right side of change because it's hit escape velocity. Is that what this is about? Is, is space another part of that whole change paradigm that you keep talking about? Yeah, we do put space into that category. We will not, uh, I can't say anything. We're in the quiet period of, uh, when it comes to the fund itself. We have to wait until the SEC deems it effective. But yes, the right side of change. And the reason is always the same. The costs associated with launching, with rockets themselves, with antenna, uh, they're all coming down dramatically thanks to uh, you know, both the private and the public sector, but I think the private sector has really helped NASA out here. You've got Elon Musk, you've got Jeff Bezos, you've got Richard Branson uh, in another way. Uh, and uh, on the technolo technology side, we see SpaceX and Blue Origin pushing the envelope. So costs are coming down and the technologies are finally ready. I think the reusable rocket that uh, Elon you know, many people were saying, why is he doing that? Why is he doing that? <laughs> uh, and uh, of course, now we know the only way he's going to be able to get to Mars or whoever the first people are, uh, we are going to need re reusable rockets to do that. Uh, and so, uh, again, it's always about cost. Right. Costs are collapsing. And it's always right. about technology being ready. Right. So, yes, 